I'll have a theme song. I've got my shovel. Oh, yeah. Shovel for digging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome to the John Show. I guess you didn't know that I was so talented. Anyway, the dealio is this morning is I had a wild edible and medicinal plant walk scheduled. However, it's funny that it can be as dry as a bone for like weeks at a time. And like my telescope observation type of scheme last week, I think, last Friday maybe, only time that it's been cloudy. And I've got my plant walk this morning, rained out. Summer people can be funny. Um, they kind of are at the whims of the weather in many cases. And whereas my first plant hike, lots of people showed up. Um, this one, not so much. Well, I prepared. That is, that is me in spades. I want to prepare to produce a quality program. Everything is sitting right shot. No one on the grounds. But you have showed up. So thank you. <laughs> The preparation went to good use, and I shall have more people watching this than maybe the 12 to 15 people that usually show up. And so the title of it is Wild Plants, Medicinal, Edible, and Invasives. I always want to throw invasives in there because it is so important. And let's just go through some definitions here. Edible, medicinal, they cross lines. Let's face it, you know, if you were to have a deficiency in calcium or, or iron or any of the Bs or vitamin C, you would be sick. Nutritionally, you're going to go and you're going to have a balanced diet, but we don't always do that. And, and so that medicinal line crosses the boundary from, <coughs> I've got arthritis or I've got um, pneumonia. To, I just have a vitamin C deficiency or vitamin B and I'm not feeling so good. So, you know, where does it draw the line? And you can even get into, when you're talking about mind, body, spirit, medicine for the mind. The natives in this area, and going out, it's a wider area than just Michigane, the big turtle, have the four medicines. And they go along with the four directions. And what's interesting is that there's some overlap here with like European culture and native. The first thing I want to talk about the four medicines, they smell good. The four medicine plants are pleasant. They smell good. They just make you happy by smelling them. Starting at the north, sweet grass, the hair of Mother Earth, um, different tribes, different groups really because in our area we have the Odawas, um, very connected to the Ojibwe's, very connected with the, the Potawatomi's. They call themselves the Three Fires. And so, at least in this, this scheme, with the, those three um, groups, major groups, they view the three braids in sweetgrass, mind, body, spirit. Others, peace, love, and harmony. And so, it's a very gentle plant. It's a very beautiful smelling plant. Good for the soul, used for smudging, used for the rims of quill boxes, which originally were storage containers for herbal type of things, plant material, pemmican perhaps, um, but has been developed to an art where the whole things are covered with quills, maybe dyed, maybe not, using the white, dark, brown pattern in the quill boxes um, to create scenes, beautiful scenes. Moving along the east, uh, by the way, the color for north was white. Makes sense, the cold, cold north, snow, time of snow, seasonality, spring, summer, fall. So you know the, the wheel of life, the medicine wheel, um, also contains those elements, seasonality. East is yellow, rising sun, giving thanks. Tobacco, tobacco is a very fragrant um, plant. Nicotina is in that family, that grouping of tobaccos, tobacco nests, and is reputed to have the most fragrant flower in the world. The leaves, the fresh leaves of tobacco, very beautiful smelling. If you were to smoke it, by the way, just dry it, pull it off, dry it, it would knock your socks off because the nicotine levels are to the moon. 
Um, the natives typically did not, they probably did not at all, take those tobacco plants and ferment them like um, European methods, you know, you burley or what have you, cigar tobacco, cigarette tobacco, smoking tobacco. Um, maybe dipped with something for flavoring, molasses, what have you, like cha, but it's fermented and it knocks the nicotine levels down to a manageable level. The natives did not do that, so they mixed it. Kinnikinick is one plant. They used to mix it with cherry bark. Um, they used to mix it with a lot of things. In fact, kinnikinick just means mix-mix, mixing with tobacco. You could smoke kinnikinick um, straight. If you didn't have tobacco, you could call that tobacco. A lot of it is just intent and not necessarily the individual plant. Tobacco um, goes along throughout North America as far as a very important plant. I, I could talk forever on this, I'm not going to. So tobacco ceremonies, you get your little pouch. If you take something, put the tobacco down there, say thank you. It's like saying grace, native style. The South Cedar, color red. Look up, heat of the day, red. Um, winter, spring, summer, the hot part of the year, red. That is cedar. Um, cedar in many cases, especially in Michigan where there was an abundance of, of sages, was used as sage. However, sage, all sages are salvias, all salvias are mints. There are plants that could be used as sage that actually have sagey characteristics in Michigan. Going along on the wheel, winter, spring, summer, autumn, the time when things are shutting down that the land is changing, getting ready for the big slate. Sage, black, black night. You could even think of that circle that you go around as a period of a day. You could think of it as your life. In some ways, as you're going around in your later years, the west, um, you become sage. Sage is connected with a wise person. And you gain wisdom as you grow older. So those are kind of medicines of the mind and the spirit. Then I'd go on to plants. Let's talk plants. Let's talk the parts of the plants. The roots, down in the ground. Um, by the way, Grandfather Bear was considered one of the wisest of animals because he knew to go down for the roots, whether it's jack in the pulpit roots or prim evening primrose roots, what have you. He could see what wasn't seen, the roots. Then it goes up the stem, which would also include the inner bark of trees. If you're talking edibility, for example, this morning, I had hash browns, a couple eggs, and some really stinky Italian cheese. You're not going to find stinky Italian cheese here, but think of that, how you can change one thing to the next by fermenting bacteria, blah, 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 probiotics. And so what I needed, I needed some high-quality starch. And not only can you find high-quality starch in roots, I'll get back to that, but the inner bark of trees. You're out there, naked and afraid. Survivor man, what have you. The wise person, when they're looking around, doesn't see a lot of stuff to eat. Of course, your, your greatest source of calories, protein, fats, or animal life. Catch that ground squirrel. Eviscerate it, because you don't want to eat the guts. Um, dry it out, or, or cook it thoroughly. Smash it up and eat the whole thing. So you're getting the, the goodness of the guts, and the brains, and eyeballs, and fats, and everything. Not just eating lean meat. But the inner bark of many trees in your area are edible and contain high-value starch. Then you go up to the leaves. Of course you eat the leaves. You had a salad. Um, leaves play a part in things. Then you go up higher. You would get the flowers. You get the seeds. Seeds usually contain a lot of fats and proteins. Although a lot of the green parts of the plants, like in, in stinging nettle, which I planted right down there, right next to the creek, because it's constantly wet and it likes wet. Um, tons of protein, a lot of protein. Hemp has protein. One of the highest proteins of any plant. And so we, there we go. You know the, um, the basics of the plants, the different medicine um, uses types. And so let's get into the basics. The first thing I like to impress upon a person is you need to know what's around you. If you don't, if you aren't able to go out and just, that's, that's a yarrow, that's an evening primrose, that's 
a wild sarsaparilla, whatever. Field guides, multiple field guides to help you key it out. And you make a list. You actually make a list and you put it in a book. I did the three ring binder kind of thing. There's spiderwort, which is very edible. And I list edibility, medicinal uses in any notes. And so I made an inventory of all the plants that are around me. And using a three ring binder and these little slavey things, I can add to it. So I've got this. I know the basic parts of the plants. I have the ba basic scheme of medicines down. I have my list of plants. So I don't need to remember all this stuff. I, I've forgotten more than I've learned. Now we're going to get into the roots. And what I have are a couple different kind of roots. I've got this one. And what you want are bulky roots. Unless it's an medicinal plant like St. John's wort that just has little roots. Um, if you're going for eating, you want to have some substance. You need to maximize the amount of foodstuffs you gather versus the caloric expenditure you spent while gathering them. So you want to get the bulk. Uh, I wouldn't use a shovel for this one. I'm not going to tell you what that is. You're going to have to figure it out. But the dry ones, natives, the aboriginal peoples around the world, use digging sticks. It's a stick. You jam it down there and kind of jimmy the root up. I use a shovel. And using this magic shovely tool, I gathered two roots. Now you're going to have to simulate these two because I use the roots. This is chicory. And if you look at this very dense um, basil flat or leaf, leaf head, you can see that there's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of mass. And, and where there's chicory, there's a lot of chicory. So you can gather a lot of it. And that's what you want to be able to gather a lot quickly. I wouldn't eat the stems. They're extremely tough and fibrous. But you could eat the leaves raw. Or you could split them, drizzle them with olive oil, and actually bake them. Use them like any green. High quality. Very nutritious. They have long tap roots. In the case of this one, which isn't an immensely large plant, the root went down this far. And I cleaned it, and I cut it into little segments, and I dried it, and then I try this with dandelions or chicory. It's oh so good. Dried it, and then I actually roasted it, just like you would coffee. And I roasted it after, after it was dry. If you're just doing it green, you have to dry it before you roast it or you're going to risk burning it. It makes it a very uneven roast. So I left it in the oven 200 degrees until it was dry and then cranked up the heat. Do the same with dandelions. Chop them into segments. Chicory, chop them into segments after you wash them. And I'm going to show you this. Look at that. It looks just like coffee. I didn't do it in a coffee grinder. I'll give you another look. I didn't do it in a coffee grinder because these roots are fibrous. They're tough. It's not like coffee that it just fractures. And so I would use a ninja or a similar device and not your coffee grinder or else you're going to bust your coffee grinder. I wish you could smell this. My guess? Hey Charles, smell this. And he's going to go, wow, that smells beautiful. It smells like a combination of coffee and chocolate. It may be a little bitter, it depends on how old the root is, but this is an amazingly good drink. And packed with vitamins and minerals. The miracle cure. Um, so try it at home. You've got dandelions, you have possibly chicory. Chop it, roast it in the oven until it's chocolatey brown. Oh, and when you open that oven, it smells so beautiful. The next root you can gather in mass. Gather in mass. Um, burdock. And you know... If you've seen burdock, those big plants with the stalk and those burry, seedy heads, you would say that, John, that's a little one. Why didn't you go after the big ones? Well, the first year plants are more nutritious than the second year plants that are big with the big stalk. Because when it starts going to flowering, it's going to use all that available nutrition to like build up the seeds fast, and it's going to deplete the roots. And so the first year plants are very much more nutritious. Poppy mallow. I have poppy mallow. It's a native plant. Unfortunately when the invasives came in 
the prairie plants like compass plant, echinacea, black-eyed Susan, poppy mallow, stuff like that, kind of went by the wayside. They were overcompeted. Although Leopold, by the way, said that the decline of the native prairies coincided with the loss of compass plant. Compass plant's a brute, nine feet tall native sunflower, taproot 12 feet down so it never needs water. And unfortunately, a lot of those plants, compass plant and the sunflower you see with the big seed heads, you're not gonna eat the root. They're bitter, um, more of a diuretic than anything. However, however, the roots aren't so hot to eat, but these, the lephuses, are just cut out the major veins and you can just eat these. Nutritious stuff. Um, I don't wanna, did I go off the of roots? Um, this is cattail, by the way, high quality starch. And you see it has these long runners. The flour that you make from this, and you can make bannock bread, um, by just mixing the dry, it kind of, it's funny, you dry it out, pound it, turn it into flour, then make it wet again. But if you take that and you glob it into a ball and make a snake out of it and wrap it around a stick and bake it, oh, it's so good. That's bannock bread. And highly nutritious. Cattail is said to be the grocery store of the woods, swamp, marsh, um, because of its value. If this was an older plant, this time of year, has that stalk and a nice fresh little um, seed head and a spike. And that spike is covered with beautiful yellow pollen and you can just tap it off and use it for the same way, flower. Okay, roots. Stuff like Echinacea again, St. John's wort. The medicinal plants, the roots are small. You're not going to get a lot of mass, but you're not looking for mass. What I find interesting, speaking of roots, is how these plants just appear. A deer got the top of this. This is valerian. Do an internet search for valerian. In Europe, commonly used as a sedative, anti-anxiety. This is blue vervain. I actually have it. It's definitely a laminaceae. Um, a mint. I'm going to try to establish this in one of my gardens, so I just have it soaking in here, and hopefully it'll form roots. Valerian, the deer knocked down the flowers. Um, beautiful little pink, weird-looking flowers. And that is that. Okay, means of intake. Oh, I forgot to mention poppy mallow over there. I went choo, off on a tangent. I would walk you over, show you this beautiful um, pink flower. And this big burly plant, native, the roots taste like sweet potatoes. They're big roots, big deep tap roots. It's another plant that doesn't need to be watered. The one, the little surface hairy roots, usually need wetter environments, except Monarda can grow like on the moon. Um, sweet potatoes, evening primrose. It's not the most beautiful of plants. It'll have like this thick stalk leaves coming off, kind of lanceolate, kind of pointy, cluster yellow flowers, on, yellow flowers on the top. You can eat the flower petals, that's good. But that also has a very nutritious root, big long tap root, relatively thick, um, so you get a lot of bang for your buck. Evening primrose. So we've got just common burdock, this, cat, cat tail, poppy mallow, um, evening primrose, common burdock. Um, they can form the foundation, tree bark, inner ground up, making the flower, the foundation of your starch. And so edible, edible, keeping, keeping the tummy full. Now going up the stalk to the seeds and nuts, kind of self berries, kind of self explanatory. Um, a nice source of, usually sweet, not necessarily always. But what I have here, is a leaf of a, of a big plantain. Plantain is a huge group. Um, and then the seed head. These seeds, not so great for gathering. Amaranth would be a small plant if you live in the western states, good for seeds. I'm missing something. I am missing something. Hopefully I can remember. Oh, back to the roots. Roots, tubers, lumps, big like potatoes that grow off the rhizomes, the, the runners. Wapato. Um, it's in the, the genus Sagittarius, Sagittarius, the archer, arrowhead. 
in ponds and other very wet, wet areas. Um, you can just walk along and knock these things loose and then they'll float up potato-like things. Well, potato, potato, ah, oh, I wonder. High quality starch. Although like jack in the pulpits, you have to, with the arrowhead, slice it, dry it completely or bake it to get rid of these volatilized acid flavor crystals or else it hurts when you eat it. Teas, infusions, decoctions, tinctures, ways to get the goodness out of things. And we know they're all kind of variations of the same thing. Taking a liquid solvent, water or alcohol, and removing the goodness. And teas are a very effective way of, of getting some nutrition, but also med medicinal qualities. And I've got some things here. And I'm going to take one of these jars and and put it up here because I mentioned fermentation and eating rotten stuff, basically like a cheese. Nature's probiotics. We need probiotics nowadays because we eat so much processed food. It's dead. It's been killed of all its little bacteriums and little floras that, um, that feed our guts, help us digest stuff. And a lot of our issues are digestion. Let's face it, you, you get plugged up, and there's plants out here that can cure it, either by fiber or medicinal qualities. Um, irritated IBS, you know, potty problems. And so I'm going to talk about that in a bit. But teas, infusions, decoctions, and tinctures. Teas are the most mild of them. You put your dried leaves in there and you steep it for a little bit. Teas. These are actually not teas, these are infusions. Take the plant, chop it up, or not, it depends, and, and boil it for a while, and then just let it simmer to get more stuff out of here. Decoctions are kind of infusions beyond. That means you'd probably take the roots, the whole plant, the roots included, chop the thing up, flowers, stems, leaves, and, and boil it for a long time with a heavy concentration to get more stuff out of it. These would be infusions, not teas. I didn't just steep them, I simmered them for a little bit. Stems, leaves, flowers in the case of one of them. And so I do not need to label these, not at all. This is Acorus calamus, could be the same as Acorus americana. Wike, sweet flag, the native word is wike. Um, in China, it's used as a memory aid. It was used in Europe. They would chop the leaves, let them dry, and then put them on the floors of churches. So when all of the unwashed people, because let's face it, during the Dark Ages and Middle Ages, people didn't shower every day, and they didn't have shampoo. Um, they would put the leaves on the ground, and whenever you walked on it, it would release a smell. It's, it, I can't compare it really to anything. Normally, the, the Native Americans would, it's got a nice bitter flavor. Bitter is good. One of the five flavors um, would use it to cessate hunger or thirst. They would chew on it. They wouldn't make like a tea, but I did this just because I was expecting a lot of people. The next one up. One of my favorites, lavender tea. You can make that strong. You're not going to kill yourself on it. Lavender tea. A lot of purposes, but my main one is, again, digestion and just relaxation. And this is aromatherapy and a nice tasting tea. Lavender makes a great tea. Um, a lot of these have antibacterial, antifungal, um, anti-something else, viral perhaps, like St. John's wort. But I mostly do tea just for relaxation, getting to sleep. What's this one? This one is an acquired taste, just common sage. And again, you can make that strong because you're not going to poison yourself. Very relaxing, good for your intestinal system, digestive system, good stuff. And the last one, peppermint. Of course, I don't need to buy peppermint tea, celestial seasoning, it grows everywhere. You can use peppermint, wild mint. I wouldn't use wild basil or self oil because they don't taste too good. Um, in the case of this blue vervain, cured my pneumonia. It's a mint family, looks like these. 
not a good taste. In fact, uh, the blue vervain in the dosages that I used caused nausea and um, rashes, but it's so anti-pneumonia, you know, antibacterial that it cured it. And so that is that. Now I am going to move on. And the nice thing about not people not coming today is I've got four jars of teas. Number five that has stuff in it. Oh, look at that. It's fermented carrots. And simply it's fun because it fizzes while it's working and then the fizzing stops and then it's done. Is you can ferment burdock, you can ferment carrots, you can ferment all sorts of roots. And that has the benefit as you're getting all that good flora in, in your guts. It's probiotics. And if you look at kimchi in Korea and real sauerkraut in Germany and all these other ways of, of preserving food. Preserving food is so fascinating to me. Salting, drying, fermenting. You can ferment meat too. You don't want to eat it while it's rotting, but when it's done then the acidity level climbs to the roof and it kills the bacteria that would make you sick. Good preservation. They preserve fish this way, fermented fish. Um, but do some research. I will just give you the basics of fermenting carrots, for example. I had, what else did I ferment in this batch? Oh, cabbage. It's plain old cabbage. Um, it's basically just soaking the things in brine. You have to, like, completely submerge them, so put, like, a round, heavy thing on there and crack it open every so often because the gases build up or get, like, some kind of a thing that people that make wine use one-way valve, um, but you ferment this stuff, and they stay crispy. These carrots are still crispy after they've fermented for a long time. They have a unique flavor, um, and you don't need to buy probiotics at 40 bucks a, a bottle. You know, really, when you get into preserving food like this, um, food pre preservation. And I guess... I have to go back to painting the privies. I hope you got something out of this. Um, the big thing is, in conclusion, know what is around you. Create your list. Create your inventory of the plants in your area. Learn how to use a field guide. Tree ring binder is a good way to do it. You don't even need to um, have a, a printer or a computer. You could just do high quality sketches. The art of it. Second thing is the value of fermenting food and a way of food pre preservation. Very good. The third thing is your homework is to go out and dig some dandelions or chicory. Experiment, you know, in your area. Maybe you could roast um, evening primrose. Maybe you could roast burdock. Roast all sorts of things and make a nice drink out of it. Chicory, I like. Because it does have a slightly bitter flavor. Mix as well with coffee like Cafe Du Monde. I'm doing a plug for Cafe Du Monde. Um, but man, it has a nice chocolatey um, overtone. It tastes chocolatey and it's a wonderful drink. Dandelions are good too, roasted. It changes the character through roasting. And look at that nice brown color right there. Those were white when they started. A little brown on the husk. I didn't peel the roots. Some people do. I don't. But the whole thing is brown because of the roasting and it changes the sugars in it. There's actually um, like a sweetener produced from chicory that doesn't jack your blood sugar so it's diabetic safe. Great stuff. And I think I covered it. Thank you for staying tuned. Thank you for going on our plant walk. I'll do one plant walk. Look at that. So I'm walking and I got a plant. Oh, good question. As far as the cattails, well, what I do is I have an area and there's a lot of root. There's a root mat. There's the water, the root mat. You always want to gather these where it's really wet. You don't want to get the ones in the dry because you'll never get the roots without breaking them off. Go into the wet areas reach down there and start pulling, breaking the root mat up um, because these are underneath that root mat. 
and the roots could be anything, grasses, what have you. And then reach down there at the base, at the base of it, because these things can be like the gooeyest, muckiest mess. And so you want to make it easy to prepare. Pull all the little root hairs, like these things, and all the smaller roots off before you even pull it up. And then just kind of feel your way down there. And if you break all those little rooty hairs off the junction there, it's going to be so much easier to clean because this is those root hairs just hold on to the thick mud. These things can be a nightmare to clean. Um, the shoots inside here, the tender shoots or the young shoots, very tasty. They taste good. The leaves are good for, for weaving stuff. The seed heads contain enough seeds to make them a viable um, source of protein. And of course you have up at the top the pollen, which you can gather in huge quantities. You'd be surprised at how much pollen can fall off a single plant. Just get a container, ch ch tap it, and it just falls in. And you can gather a lot fast. That's the key, gathering a lot fast. 